And so, Volker, I really appreciate uh, your time today to talk more about 3D printing. And, and I think uh, Vertico has a very interesting uh, take on this market, a very interesting position in the market. You know, a lot of what I've seen in the projects that you guys have done are, are supplemental uh, to, to a building, right? We're, we're seeing uh, an appeal to architects, even in the posts that you make on, on Facebook. Topology optimized bridge, I, you know, looked into that project, 60% less concrete and 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 so really a lot of things surrounding the house i wanted to hear more from you you know what other sort of products services do you think you can provide to architects that they may not be thinking of just because so many people are focused maybe on the house house itself but there's a lot more to do here my hobby was you know plastic printing that's where i think most people start kind of low low end ish right at home and uh, I kind of realized also in 3D printing, um, you see the market for plastic, it was much older. So you can kind of follow the trends that you saw in plastic and, and paste them onto concrete. And the, the most successful projects, in my opinion, in, in plastics as well, are the ones that really utilize the advantages of printing. And, and one of those being form freedom, obviously, um, function integration. Those are the types of things that really jump out at you when you 3D print. And I wanted to apply those more to the concrete printing area as well. So what we sort of specialize in is not the building of, you know, walls and straight walls or almost you know, slightly curved walls. I thought, how far can we push that form freedom? Um, and so that kind of hinged also on the aesthetic side. So in my interest is more in architecture, because I think the value add of 3D printing is also to start on the high end. Again, similar to plastic printing, a lot of projects that started were things that were unique, you know, just to showcase what's possible. And in my opinion, in architecture, there's so much still to be done uh, with this technology that um, the aesthetic side of it's just very important. I think some of the columns, we, the projects we do now, like the columns we're kind of uh, showing, uh, that's the kind of thing I want to see in the near future where architects utilize this um, really highly aesthetic appeal to implement into projects where we can use them as formwork um, to uh, uh, you know fill with concrete and rebar and overcome some of the constructive difficulties. So yeah, it's the aesthetic side, the form freedom that we're focusing on in order to differentiate within the market. Yeah, and I think this is actually in some ways more, it's just better timed than an actual house because you, you'll you see in mainstream media, $4,000 3D printed house. And we of course know that that is even close to true in a field of what reason, for a field of reasons. But what is true about 3D printing is that you know, cost and complexity are not linked, you know, and, and Kevin says this uh, a lot as our chief engineer officer, it really is true. And so if you appeal to higher end uh, clients, luxury housing, things where people are looking for that uniqueness, I think today's like, it's profitable today. It makes sense today because people are, are willing to spend more for that. And, and that only makes sense. Over time, of course, our, our hope as an organization is that break even profitability for affordable housing, you know, comes in the next uh, three to five years, hopefully, but we'll see where that goes. So let's talk a little bit more about those supplemental pieces uh, and, and different things that can be added to existing projects that architects and builders are working on today. So we mentioned, uh, uh, bridges and benches, facades are things that I've seen. But what other things out there that you're either working on or have thought of that are like, this is is prime for 3D printing today? So first of all, thanks for trying to debunk the myth of the $4,000 house. I couldn't, you know, ask enough people to debunk that. Um, it's very annoying because the amount of calls that we get for, you know, how many houses can I do in Costa Rica? How many can I do in Canada? How many can, it's not how it works, right? I'm not gonna fly over there and magically make some houses appear for you. It's just not how it works. So I agree with you again that the high end stuff, um, at, least, at least for now, um, justifies the cost of uh, this innovation. Um, again, to emphasize the columns, uh, they're just a great way to introduce this technology and merge it with existing and traditional techniques. The same goes for any sort of detail on a house, right? So you're talking anything around a window or any or an add on, uh, you know, something that isn't uh, a skyscraper, um, you know, that where where we can actually utilize this form freedom, more curved walls or, you know, extreme sort of positions. And um, let's not forget, people still want straight walls to put their shelves up against. Right. So in that sense, you know, straight is good. 
but it really pop out then then the curvature that we can you know see in in in, in uh, nature so the biomimicry that's something that you suddenly have access to so when you start combining that with um horticultural sort of you know um uh exploitations um maybe interior design or even even in garden design you see a lot of opportunities when it comes to uh, vases or when it comes to fencing or when it comes to you know uh, all types of of uh things in and around the house i think there's a quite a large market there too um where the sort of the cost is lower the the risk is lower right if you want a house you're really doing it for the innovation factor right now but if you want something beautiful, like a column or a vase or whatever, you're already basically guaranteed of something that's the quality that it should be. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think even looking at something like a concrete planter, like a, a large one that they would use in a commercial setting or certain residential settings. I mean, these things are literally $1,600 U.S., um, for yeah. for one of those and, and I'm only imagining well you know this is a, a not a permanent structure or a structure right you don't need to go to the uh, housing and urban development and pull a permit to build one of those so there's a lot of reasons right. why I think that's probably profitable today now, even maybe even and I'd like to get your your thoughts like uh, is that profitable even against traditional products today it's it's kind of complex and there's there's two issues that you mentioned there first of all the uh, sort of permitting etc and the norms and standards that we're up against um one of the things that i think has made us successful so far is being very adept in avoiding problems so something like norms and standards you can avoid by making form work and then filling with traditional methods mm -hmm. it also calms the nerves of the constructors that are involved and the architects that are involved in the project so we need that kind of uh, we need to circumvent in some sense some of the things that have been built over many 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 years in the construction industry so let's start there then when you talk about costs for example planters and whatnot um, the actual cost of production is is quite low perhaps also for for planters but because they're so ubiquitous or because they're so um, there's so many companies already in the market um, there's certain price points set already we see now that when we're talking about planters or um, even columns we can already compete with the price that's on the market and um, don't forget that the just the incredible form freedom that we can show on these objects um, uh, let's say that they're the same planter right for the same price it, just imagine we're still making form freedom that's so much more the value added there is not even calculated in the price right so let's say bottom line for the same price we can make something that's extremely unique where every single planter you have in an office building for which we get a lot of requests right let's say you want 50 60 planters and every single one is different but every single one is made with the same technique and the same sort of software so you see a unification across your interior design but you get an extremely large amount of unique objects and that has got to be fascinating for architects right that, that has got to be interesting for designers and for people that want to make something that really stands out yeah i think it's i think it's so fascinating that it's hard to even brainstorm sometimes it's literally like i don't know whatever you want yeah and people are like yeah. uh, a box let's go it's like, no, no no you don't have to make the same thing yeah. every single time uh so so yeah. what do you want it's like uh, a box you know <laughs> like i really think it's going to take a couple years to for uh, and, and maybe Educate even a decade market. for us to get into almost the consumer preferences the new the a new yeah. mindset of what's possible and what would be appealing we were talking to Theo Salat uh, from uh, from Eindhoven as well and he was he was talking about that's going to take some time innovation works this way just when you have that miracle machine in your hand it takes the market some time to respond and so uh, I think that's very interesting and and so as an organization just for some background we're working on a, a phased business model where we actually change what we do with time and so we know that a, a 3D printed house right now it can cost 140%, 300% more. I mean, the, the numbers aren't even well understood or documented in the folks that we've talked to, but we know it's more expensive. So what if right now we work on making things like planners and retaining walls and, and landscaping and architectural supplements that can give us almost this sort of break even phase of our business model, uh, maybe make a yeah. little bit of money, but then have us be positioned, right? Have uh, have the, the knowledge, the staff, everything ready for that next phase when 
when 3D printed houses really do become an affordable thing. I wanted to get your feedback on that thought of how you know organizations like ours might be changing with, with the technology and how even yours might. Yeah, it's interesting. I know Theo uh, Salet well in the sense that, you know, obviously we're both in Antelva. He's one of the reasons, you know, we moved to Antelva as a company too, because they are there and there's a lot of concrete printing happening here. I sort of jokingly call it the concrete printing capital of the world. That's how much is going on here in Eindhoven right now. Um, he and I are in the same, same um, of the same thought, I think, in the sense that um, how do we uh, educate the public, you know, on what is what is actually possible in there? And you saw the same thing with plastic printing. When I did a lot of projects early on in my career, um, I saw what was possible, but I really needed to get the engineers on board. And one of the ways to do that was to start with small projects. And then once you see there, you know, the glow in their eyes of, oh man, you know, we can we can do additive. You know, we have a delivery time of three weeks, uh, or you know, with design, etc., instead of months and iterations. And we can try we can try stuff out. You know, this rapid prototyping. That's what really gets people um, over the line. Um, he, Teos, that's also a big proponent of, you know, the sort of the milestone type projects. You know, you, you do a few so that people get used to the idea of doing it. And I think when you talk about pivoting or, you know, the organic growth in the company, we did, we do and did the same. Um, you have a very interesting way of doing it by sort of using this channel, using this, this sort of outlet to both educate the actual, uh, you know, the market. And early on when we were starting printing, we talked to a lot of 3D printers, you know, in Holland as well. It's one of the great things about having so many companies sort of they're not they're sort of competitors, but they're not in, in many, many ways. And um, because we all do the things together, um, we grow much more um, sort of know how and also sort of much more acceptance. So we like to do that, too. Your channel is one way to do that, to create sort of attention and educate. Uh, we pivoted the same so we started um, i actually also developed a plastic printer that printed recycled plastic but there's already a lot of plastic printers on the market and concrete gave us the opportunity to go for architecture so we were doing that as well with a couple of companies so that's what we developed and there's just much more um there's much more market potential right now and so uh, the organic growth we started with wanting to be a print shop but there isn't any demand for print and there wasn't any demand for printing, right? There was demand for machines. So in that sense, we started producing the machines. We had a working machine and we started to sell it. And this year we sold several machines uh, and are delivering the machines. And that's a way for us to create revenue now um, in order to finance basically our own growth. And in time, what I projected and what I see happening now is that the initial two, three years of my company, let's say from now on two, three years will be mainly um, in terms of revenue sale of machines. Um, but you see the sort of the printing projects um, equal, start to equal probably next year, the year after that, the sort of revenue we're generating. Mm -hmm. um, and we like to do that too, right? Uh, so the business, the four things we do as a company is one, we sell hardware. Uh, the other is we sell the software, which obviously we developed to slice the software and to run the robots. The other is doing printing as a service. And the fourth is consultancy. And also the fourth is like, we get a lot of questions on what's possible. So, you know, I love answering questions about concrete printing, but at some point it becomes consultancy. So these four business models, we're, we, we will probably keep like this because I'm also convinced that you have to do projects in order to develop your technology. So I think that will remain um, uh, the way that sort of we organically grow. We have the sort of basis set in those four markets, but the PMCs, you know, the sort of products we produce, that's the thing that's going to be organically growing now. And we see more and more business cases come up. You know, everybody's waiting for the business case. Um, and I'm very happy that many companies are investing in our printers, um, even though they might not have a straight cut business case yet, right? So universities do, I fully get that. But there are also companies that see the potential. So there are early movers. We love early movers. And at the same time, we are also seeing more and more real business cases starting to emerge. And that I love to see. What your opinions and perspectives are versus robot uh, from a robotic arm versus a gantry system. Now, you're a robotic arm guy, so I'm about to hear some some thoughts on why that makes sense. But I wanted to, you know, get your thoughts for decision makers out there who might be looking at the Vertico product uh, and the services wrapped around it. Like why why robotic arm and why now? Yeah, that's, that's, you know, a hot topic always, you know, first you have robotic versus gantry, and then you have on-site, off-site, um, you know, they're interlinked. For me, what I usually tell customers, if you're looking for a robotic or a gantry machine, you want to go for a gantry machine if you want to go really big. So if you really need to make something that's larger than the build volume of your traditional industrial robot, then it might well be the only option. So there are some options of combining a gantry with a robot 
you know, if you have deep pockets, you can do that. Like the ETA Zurich, many of us will know, you know, just hang a robot upside down and go. But if you want to make something that's bigger than the build volume, let's say you want to make something that's bigger than four meters high, um, you want to go for a gantry, right? So this is the housing type area. What you lose in that sense is the degrees of freedom. So I did work on two gant or a gantry machine that's built in the Netherlands here that's now in Swinburne University. We did the factory acceptance test for the machine. And that is a six axis gantry, but it's the only one of its kind as far as I know in the concrete printing sphere. Um, but so it's basically large, right? Most gantries have three axes and then you're, you're limited to what they sort of call two and a half D printing, right? So it's layer on layer on layer on layer. Now with the robotic arms, we're on a six or seven axis uh, degree of freedom. So basically what I always say, you have the degrees of freedom of, an, of a human arm, right? So you're much more, it's not just simple up and down. You're much more flexible to go around and around and around. So we're actually making objects now. We're going to be um, installing a pavilion uh, sort of end of the summer. And that actually doesn't only use a two and a half D. Do we have a line width that increases over, over distance? It has a curve in the object and a double curve in the object. And we're going parallel to the printing, um, uh, the printing line. And it, it's about uh, two and a half, three meters long. And it, the smallest part has a, a height of about t uh, six, seven millimeters. And the, the tallest part up to 20 uh, approximately. So that's just, it's an extremely difficult object. So it's really high end where you're using the full degrees of freedom of everything. Now, not everybody needs to be doing that, right? That's, that's serious coding going on. Um, but that degree of freedom you have. And what you can also do with a robot is use the simple um, three degrees of freedom, right? That, or at least, you know, sort of X, Y, Z. So anything a um, gantry is capable of doing in the robot envelope, a robot can do as well and most likely better um, because they're very stiff and they're very fast. Uh, they're very flexible in that sense. Um, and in, in many, many ways, they're much more cost effective, right? So a uh, decent gantry machine, a large gantry machine, you're looking at 300,000 euros you know, or more. Um, but when you're looking at a robot machine, you know, we can set up a robot machine for 120. And that's, that's just a big difference, right? So if you want to get started in 3D concrete printing, a gantry is, in my opinion, just not the way to go. Mm -hmm. If you're fully convinced mm -hmm. by the robot within a year or two or three of actually you want to print things, you want to go bigger, then convince, you know, uh, whatever partners, find the money, buy a gantry, go on site, you know, go for it. But start with a robotic arm where you can, you know, freely experiment in house on a small um, on a small space. Right, space is often a, a confining factor too. Maybe in the U.S. a little bit less, but <laughs> mostly everywhere else in the world, we got to go inside buildings that are, you know, more compact, uh, more and more dense. So a robotic arm just gives you so much more freedom um, for a better price generally. And yeah, I don't see why you would want to go gantry straight away. There's so much innovation going on in the space that I wanted to talk about that Gardner hype cycle. It's just by coincidence, I was a market research and competitive intelligence uh, professional in enterprise software. So I'm weirdly familiar with, with not only Gartner, but the conferences. Uh, yeah. We love your take on you know, where we're at in, and the best thing I love about that is the trough of disillusionment is this, <laughs> the strangest phrase in English, but it kind of makes a lot of sense, especially in this, uh, in this space, maybe, uh, headed towards us, but wanted to get your feedback on where, where we're at, where are we at in that hype cycle? So I think Gardner hype cycles, it, I like the fact that it's out there and that people kind of know sort of what we're talking about because it gives you a, a, a point to talk about. And in the Gardner hype cycle, what I saw um, is in the Netherlands, um, we might have crossed the peak already because there are so many companies doing this. There's enough companies doing this and enough people involved that this sort of hype I saw in the beginning, when I just started my company, I was, you know, compared to the three other people that are doing it in the market now, I was relatively late. Um, and so I kind of stepped in while the hype was really high, right? That's one of the reasons why we were able to make that small machine to go to conferences because the demand was incredible. I think in markets where it's less well known, I think the U.S. is is uh, for its size, it's slightly behind in the in the amount of concrete printing being done. So you know, you maybe you're still climbing uphill on that Gardner hype cycle, but um, for my feeling, we've kind of crossed over the the, the peak. Um, trough of disillusionment. Uh, I think that you know the projects that are being done now are real projects. The bridges that are happening here, the milestone house. I think there, you know, we re we already see companies that have um, tried and failed to do projects in concrete printing. You know, they stepped away. 
So seeing that is, you know, you're over a hype. If people are already trying it and already saying, okay, this is not for us. We need specialists like our company, for example, to guide us in that. We're already over the peak. And I think in some companies you don't see that, like on the RFQs we get, you know, we can still see, okay, there's still some hype going on. You know, how many, again, what I said, can I print 300 houses? You know, how about no? Um, <laughs> so you're still climbing the hill, right? Um, just to disillusion those people a little bit. Well, but we're, I, we're down yeah, and, yeah. and we're crawling up with, you know, real PMCs and real market. And, you know, the revenue we're generating is, it's something we can really base a business case on. And that means that we're really, you know, we're really on the up and up here, um, past, hopefully past a bit of the, at least the initial sort of hype. Yeah, I think I think there's a quote. This all uh, summarizes very well. Uh, everybody appreciates honesty uh, until you're honest with them, right? Uh, I think that that in this space, I actually appreciate what Printed Farms is doing, what Jared's doing, and so many others. It's it's saying, listen, we just kind of we have to understand that all technology is like this, e even miracle technology. Look at the internet yeah. bandwidth, a microwave, cell phones, even when we have the technology in our hand to get it into market, to make it uh, feasibly profitable, it just takes time. So if you're in this space of innovation, you understand those curves, this is very expected. Uh, but again, if you're yeah. just watching the news, you see a, 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 an awesome headline, um, that's when you get really disappointed and when you don't understand that innovation curve. You know, yesterday we were talking to Jose Duarte, who's who runs the a program at Penn State University. And, and with his uh, research, he's working on a, a smart nozzle, right? And, and the ability to change the sh shape of the nozzle and a number of things um, dynamically and, and in, in combination with software so that um, so many more things are possible with the deformation of, of, of the concrete mixture. Now, your machine is unique uh, with Vertico because it's, it's a much smaller, obviously, than in my understanding than these giant machines. Tell me a, a little bit more about how you see nozzles changing specifically with robotic arms. Yeah, so I think it's good to know for people that are watching this. Hopefully, there you know there's there's some people that are knowledgeable on the subject of gantries and uh, printers, but some aren't. So in concrete 3D printing, what you can generally have is two nozzles. So the first nozzle is, is a relatively simple one, which is a steel tube um, or just a hopper where the concrete just comes out. And when you're accelerating uh, on a large building less slowly, it's not it's not a particularly complex thing, right? It's the pump that's more important. It goes to your nozzle. It's a steel pipe and it extrudes. When we're talking about the accelerated nozzle, it's more complex because there's all going on in the nozzle itself uh, where you're adding the accelerant, you're mixing that in a particular way, and then you're extruding in a particular way. So there's a large difference in complexity when it comes to the actual mechanics of that particular machine, right? And when we're talking nozzle. Um, and I had, so I had, you know, I, I do this, think about this, you know, 24 seven, I have all these ideas too, about how you could, you know, squeeze a nozzle or make it a different shape or make it turn or, you know, make, scrape it down or make it smoother. There are many innovations to come still. Um, for me, uh, as I said, we're quite good at sort of avoiding problems. So we like to tackle one thing at a time. So right now we're still, you know, extruding, um, we're extruding just from a set standard um, uh, nozzle size, but the innovation that we thought was more interesting in the short term was to be able to go, you know, in six degrees of axis and really um, exploit how we can make those forms, right? And for that, a circular nozzle is more than enough. The square nozzles you see, so an alternative, of course, for the people that might not know, is to have a square nozzle, wherein you know you have slightly your sort of straighter prints that are smoother on the sides because a round nozzle will give you a sort of round deformation on the sides where material isn't doing much, and a straight nozzle sort of helps that, right? But when you're cornering, uh, you can't simply corner because you get a weird line. You got to move your nozzle around um, to be able to lay that thing around the corner. So you know this, but many, many might not. Um, so the, how smart a nozzle becomes is a matter of time, right? The focus right now for us in what is the next step in smarter nozzles is monitoring. So we've done, you know, the degrees of axes. We've done the acceleration that we can get it down to 30 seconds. We make some, you know, pretty amazing, in my opinion, aesthetic objects with the form and patterns that we just make it change. Um, but then the next step is, okay, how are we going to make this process monitored? And, and right now in the Netherlands, but elsewhere too, this is a hot topic in concrete printing because we are adding pressure sensors to the nozzle, temperature sensors to the nozzle. We're looking at humidity sensors, right? Flow sensors. These are the things that are really quite exciting. 
So you might not see them from a from a print you know a point of view, but from a user point of view, um, when we do a print, uh, we get a nice graph of the print itself. Hopefully, it's nice and flat where the pressure hasn't changed over time. But when the pressure does change, we're able to relate it to you know did it change in the pump? Did it change in the nozzle? Did the temperature change? What's the delta on the temperature? Can we see something happening in the print? You know, is it hot outside? What's the humidity? So you basically get like a photo um, of the print you just made. And so that's more of the behind the, themes, the scenes things, but that's the things that users now want. Mm -hmm. So all, all credit, you know, Penn State doing all interesting things. I think that's the, the, the purview of universities to go wild and do crazy stuff. But it's kind of our role a little bit to kind of make it um, to do, yeah, do the cool stuff, but also to monitor and make it safe, to make it reliable. So for us personally, reliability is now the big issue with the with the machines. How can we make it the most reliable, most user friendly machine? And then we can move into more complex, weird nozzles or, you know, other type of materials going on. So let's let's yeah. let's tackle the basics well. Yeah, no, I think, uh, again, going back to that Cobot example in, in Florida with printed farms, you know, my brothers, they're, you know, watching it, you know, they, they say literally in the presentation the day before, the best conditions are between 50 degrees and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And what happens the next day, they eclipse 90 degrees and you can start to see the print quality, you know, go down. So how we get that reliability is so much of the equation. You can put all the humans you want on the problem and that's just not going to be as good as the combination of these sensors and softwares. It just, it'll never be just like it is. That's true in so many other types of technologies. But I wanted to ask you this question about how you work with university students uh, and, and, you, the connection to that, you know, Theo would say uh, the triple helix or the quadruple helix, you know, he's he's talked to us about this thought of the combination of industry plus university and um, and government. And and since the United States is is kind of far behind in, com in comparison to, to where you're at, you know, what can organizations like ours do to work with students, help universities and create a better market in the United States and around the world for this space? There's quite a few questions there. Let me see if I can tackle them uh, one by one. Um, uh, to start, when people want to buy a printer from us, um, when I, you, know, you kind of notice a certain customers uh, that want to do printing projects, I always say, look, if you're starting up, I'm really glad to help. Um, what I recommend you do is find a few partners, You know, at least find either a construction firm or a concrete manufacturer or and or a university and or a local government. If you can, if you can have these to go, then you have a strong basis to be able to, to be able to make something that lasts, right? So when you, so let's focus then in this case on on the the universities. Um, I recently, uh, we recently sort of uh, had a press release about our printing on Mars, uh, or for Mars, however you want to put it. And initially, when I was asked to do this with the TU Delft, who is one of the front runners here on the technical universities in the, in the Netherlands and and the world. Um, I was initially in the sense skeptical because I'm thinking, you know, Mars, um, I'm quite a, you might have noticed I'm a relatively practical guy. What am I, what am I supposed to be doing on Mars? Right. Um, and then we start this project and I'm talking to these people that I, that are doing uh, kites on Mars and rovers on Mars. And they're explaining to me about zero gravity issues. And we're thinking about all these problems with heat distribution and whatnot. And then we started printing something that has a sort of uh, what's called a Voronoi pattern for structural optimization, but also a sort of squiggling pattern in order to increase the surface area of the object to dissipate the heat. I'm thinking, damn, that's like what a motor works like. You know, you have these fins on the side in order to get the heat transmitted. And we printed these objects. And the next day I'm talking to a client and they're saying, look, we want to print these houses for this electrical equipment outside. And we have heating issues. And I'm thinking, well, check out this project we're doing for Mars now, where we figured out if we do this heating distribution pattern, we get and structural, uh, structural support, and we get the heat uh, characteristics that you want to cool down your object. So it was an immediate reminder to me of how important uh, these projects can be, right? Jose yeah. from Penn State is, is working on a project in Alaska, and there's lots of environmental conditions there um, as it relates to temperature. Um, so, you know, huge, huge challenges. Yeah, and what I saw, we you know, with the students going in there too. Um, I was doing a presentation for them, and and they they you know obviously they, they struggle with okay, what am I? What are we supposed to do? We're going to Mars. Like, how are we gonna? What are the, what what are the things we need to be looking at? And I told them, look, your role as students in this case, and maybe as universities, is not to find the answers. It's to find the questions. 
So if you if you if you if they focus on these finding the right questions like okay how does this work uh, with heat distribution how does that work that translates immediately to my market where I'm trying to implement these things in the real world and I'm going hey wait a minute that was a good question right so how are we tackling that and how is our technology helping answer that question and that gives us a stepping stone to other things so I'm quite impressed now when I started you know we developed a, I started with a robot no experience we had to develop our own software. Um, I used um, a little 3D printer and the software off the 3D printer, the small ones, the Ultimakers. I shot into the robot and had, you know, mixed results, to put it lightly. Um, and then I realized, wait, this isn't working. So I organized the hackathon and we had some students fly in and they, you know, within, within hours, they had something that sliced way better than what I had been, you know, fiddling with. And that kind of merged into the software we have now, where we have a pretty advanced slicer to do the, the thing. So that's built on students. And then now, even three years later, I'm talking to these students from Delft University, and they have the knowledge. One of the guys we recently hired is extremely adept at grasshopper modeling. And that launched us, you know, a real step further into the sort of objects we can make. So that, that really is the role, uh, too, uh, of universities. And they helped us make the software, for example, and then because I wanted to help other startup companies um, to, you know, have that first barrier removed, I made a free online version of this basic software called Slicer Excel, along with a Dutch company, Wide Linus, and a university here called Saxion, just to be like, look, guys, we, this is our lesson learned. It wasn't fun. Here's a free version. You have that one little hurdle already taken away. And then if you're serious about it, call us. And you can buy the full version. We'll give you the proper training. You know the right questions to ask, right? So on universities, I'm glad they're mm, producing students that are able to do, uh, to, they have these skills, the parametric skills, the, rest, the rhino skills, the robot skills that are really applicable to the things we're doing now. So I'm glad the, the universities you know, play that role.